Good morning. Of course, I'm very happy to be here because this is a very important conference. I'm also happy to be in Barcelona because it's a beautiful uh, city. Even if we share with Italy some crisis now, but we will for sure recover through design and creativity. And I, I'm also particularly interested to the topic because, uh, as has been said uh, kindly in my presentation, it's uh, more or less 20 years that I deal with very um, immaterial stories about services, a new form of organization, some kind of quality related to social innovation. But I was particularly <coughs> interested on the fact that is, I know that is not the only focus, but this is a, a conference in which the focus on the makers movement, the fab labs, the possibility of building, making things in a different way is particularly important. So I will uh, make my presentation trying to put together what is my experience, because I don't have experiences on this specific topic. As I said, my experience is more on social innovation and design for social innovation that until now has been mainly on the service side, as we will see but try to create a parallelism with this new movement that is emerging. I have also to say a little biographic uh, story that uh, in some way, I don't know if it is interesting, but I tell it in any case, when I started my career, I wrote a book on materials. It was called Material Invention 30 years ago. And after war, progressively, I moved towards something that was the opposite of the materials. And so now I'm fascinated to the idea that something so n new and important is happening, talking about how we deal with materiality of our world. So this is why I use the opportunity of this conference to challenge what I normally do in this, uh, normally talk about in the last uh, two decades, with something that is uh, so new for me, but in some way also linked to my very old story. I put under the umbrella of distributed and open production what is uh, every kind of new distributed production. So all those ideas that we will see that break the traditional, now traditional way of thinking, the global production around the world. And uh, looking from outside, uh, I was thinking why I like it so much, what is new? At the end of the day, the maker movement is also called the do-it-yourself. The do-it-yourself is something that always existed. In some way, it's also a kind of craftsmanship. So also craftsmanship always existed. So what is new? Mainly what is new is not so much the machine. OK, the 3D printer, the laser cutters, etc., are new machinery. But what is new is that they are linked. So the new is that you are somebody that have a kind of approach as a traditional craftsman or as a traditional hobby person, but those people are connected. And this maybe also is not enough. What uh, is really making the difference is that there is a, a movement. And this is very important socially, because uh, technology is important, but what really change into the society is when there are a group of people that are starting to act even if they are minority, but become very active minorities. So what we have now, of course, we have some new technology, as I said, the miniaturization of some machinery that is very important. We have that they are connected, and the, re, the miniaturization of the machinery and the connection in between uh, different uh, groups and persons working in this way create a kind of movement. And the movement are the driver of larger change. So here, as you understand, in some way we go more near to my traditional way of talking about the social innovation and transformation. So in some way, in my view, even if uh, the major driver of change is uh, some transformation in the technology, at the end of the day, what makes this movement so interesting is more the social issue. So in some ways, they are social technical groups that are doing something that is challenging the traditional way, mainstream way of thinking what is production and what is co consumption. Where are the weakness? 
I don't dare, as I said, I'm very enthusiastic of what is happening. So I think that is very important. But looking from outside, I cannot, uh, not to say that there are some weakness, and I think that everybody could recognize all those people are very willing in promoting processes and show that something is possible. But at the end of the day, when you look what has the, the final result, what they do, uh, we could have serious uh, interactive mark on the meaning of all that. So if we were to be nasty, if I had to, to judge everything that happens in, uh, by the point of view of the final result, we could say that may, maybe they are even negative because they are producing gadgets that is really no needs of the majority of them. So, but I think that you, and uh, at least for me, I know that uh, at the beginning of the story, you need somebody that is very enthusiastic and that focus on something. And here the focus is on the process. What we can discuss, if, if this uh, strength that we have uh, focusing on making things differently in some way, not taking yet so much care about what you do, will uh, meet new and larger vision, new and larger possibility, and create something that could be really more substantial by many points of view. So, I tell you now what are the hypotheses that I will present in my speech, so at least you know what is the story, and if you don't like it, you can have a nap. And, uh, and this, this is my hypothesis, that there are two convergence, convergences. Uh, the first one already happened, and is the one on which I personally have worked in the last uh, 10 years. And it's the convergence in between a kind of a large wave of social innovation that happened around the world, that at the beginning, let me say, it was very low-tech, so people that did something using very, very basic technology, and uh, the high-tech, especially internet and afterward, the social media, and whatever is under the umbrella of social networks, and so we have had uh, this kind of convergence, and thanks to this convergence, we are passing, f facing now a very deep change in the idea of service. And the idea of service are not only a small part of our world, service are around us. So the way in which people collaborate to get a result, because the very general definition of service is every time that you have uh, somebody interacting to create together some results. So the way in which people can interact for having some results, that is a very important part of our life, has been and is being and could be more than now transformed by what uh, the movement of the social innovation and the movement of the social networks merging together are generating. Now I think that you understand what I want to say. I want to say that maybe we need the similar kind of convergence in between movements of social innovation that until now have been mainly related to services, and now this new movement about the makers and the merging could be a larger new model of production. If we could have the both together, I think that we are really witnessing something that is uh, incredibly important in the transition towards sustainability because we start to have not only ethical words about uh, the fact that we should have a sustainable reality, a sustainable society, but we start to have the real concrete possibility to imagine how it could be. And in my view, if we imagine all the story of the social network, and social innovation, creating new services, and all the story of the distributed and open production and social innovation, creating a new system of production, all together create a new scenario. And uh, just to give a name to this scenario, I call it the SLOC, more local, open, and connected. Okay, this is uh, the story. Now, there should be somebody that tell me when it's finished. Is you? No, no, to have it for when it's uh, 20. Hmm? Okay. No, because sometimes I forget the sense of time. So now let me go back to the 
main issue for me at least, that is social innovation. Um, when I started to talk about social, I, I talk about design for social innovation. I mean, there are somebody else that are talking about social innovation much better. But in any case, when we started to talk about social innovation, design for social innovation was always necessary to spend half of the presentation in explaining because nobody knew what it is. Now I see that everybody is talking about that, so we can consider that in some way at least it's spread through the society and also through the design community. In any case, social innovation always existed. It's uh, not something new. It's uh, the fact, as in this very short definition, that you can, in the society, you can generate ideas that can solve some problem in a social way. And this is uh, probably a capability that human beings have had from the beginning of the history of human being. So why we name it in a certain way and why it was not named in that way? There are two different mo motivations. One motivation is that for one century, uh, the other side of innovation, that is the technological innovation, has been so strong that uh, everybody, I think, including myself, until a few years ago, if we tell innovation without adjective, everybody would think it was a technological innovation. And there was some good reason for that. Eh? But in the reality, we discovered that, we rediscovered that the innovation, that means ideas that enter in the society and change the society. This is innovation. So the ideas that can enter in society and change the society can not, are not only starting from the technological side, it means on the scientific and technical laboratory, but they can start also in the street, proposed by ordinary people. And also these are inventions. And the inventions are social inventions, socially generated inventions. And those socially generated inventions can enter in the society, reinforce themselves, and change. So we discovered something that probably was, as I said, always clear, that in the real reality, we don't have social innovation or technical innovation. We have socio-technical innovation. There is no technical innovation that is only technical, and there is no social innovation that is only social. But we live in a social technical system that innovate. But it's useful, given that we have for one century said innovation and talked about the technical innovation, now it's useful to stress that there is also a social technical innovation mainly driven by the social side, and so to call it, to simplify, social innovation. The second motivation is that the social, mo social innovation, in the way that I say now, is social technical innovation moving from the social side, uh, is not linear. Whoever knows something about the technological innovation knows, because it has been studied so much, that innovation goes by waves. So there are waves of innovation, moments in which you have a cluster of new ideas that appear and after consolidate. So this story about innovation has been, technical innovation has been studied a lot. So who studied the, the social innovation discovered that also social innovation goes for waves. And if we now are talking about social innovation, it because for some reason that we will see, we are in the middle of a big wave of social innovation. So something is happening or happened that is generating a new large wave of social innovation. So we are talking about that first because we want to say, look, there is not only technology production, but the driver could be also society. And secondly, because as a matter of fact, something is happening that created. it. And what is happening that created? it? It's very simple. People invent something new when they have problems. And uh, the problems can be solved through some technological invention, but they can be solved by people that being there, they know, how to, they, they know the problem and they can find out what to do. So I'm not, of course, <laughs> going to <laughs> pass through all these problems because they are very clear. I want only to say that all those problems that I put on the, on the, on the screen are <clears throat> what is called untractable problems. 
So a problem is that if you don't change something in your mind, you cannot solve them. And uh, I take one, the first one, just, uh, is the first one, see? The first one, just to give an idea, and also because it's uh, related to myself. The issue about the elderly population is something that has been managed during the history of human beings. Always you have had some young people and some elderly people. And the solution could be you have a village, you have a clan, you have a family, or you have a state that take care of the elderly. And there have been many different strategies, mixing in different ways in between the families, as could be in Italy, maybe in Spain, or the state, as it could be in the north of uh, Europe, uh, or other way. But all this strategy had a common denominator, was based on something common, that uh, the society had a certain demographic structure. And there were a lot of young people, and very few elderly people. And so it was uh, a village, it was a family, it was uh, the state. Uh, there was a lot of people that could work to create the resources to, in some way, serve the elderly. Now, as you know, in Europe, in Italy, imagine Spain, but it will be everywhere, also in the countries that are now relatively young, the demographic pyramid is, going, is already shifted. We have a lot of elderly people and few young people. So there is no one of the traditional strategy that can help in solving the problem, because it's not the state that can, with few people working, maintain so many elderly, and it's not a family with maybe a couple that have four elderly people to maintain. If you add that the medicine and healthcare can maintain people alive, uh, also when they are uh, very sick, this creates a lot of problems. So what to do? You can kill the elderly people. This could be a solution. Uh, it's not the, my favorite one, but uh, it's one of the possibilities. If you don't choose these ones, what, what can be done? Traditionally, you don't have answer to this question. So, the wise man says, if a question has no answer, you have to change the question. And when you change the question, it means that you move from an incremental innovation to a radical innovation. So the radical innovation is innovation in which you do not only find a new solution, but you change the question in the same moment in which you find the solution. And in the case of the social innovation, what has invented that is radically new is to redefine who are the elderly. And so the issue is not how a society, how families, how the state can take care of the elderly, but how the elderly can take care of themselves. And what a family, what the state, what the society can do to help this process. Why this can be done? Because if you move from the stereotype of who are the elderly to who are the, so the stereotype of the elderly to who are the elderly, you can discover that a lot of elderly people are capable of doing things, and maybe also <clears throat> willing of doing things. And maybe sometimes they are sick because they have nothing to do that they feel to be important. So in the moment in which you don't consider some, you don't start thinking, that the elderly are needy, but thinking that the elderly are resources, everything changes and some solution can be found. And this is uh, what is happening. The, the social innovation has generated several ideas of how to create different kinds of services in which the elderly people are considered as a part of the solution and not as a part of the problem. I stop here. I took five minutes to explain this one, just to enter a little bit and to give you the flavor of what does it mean, a radical change in the way of thinking that those uh, innovations are proposing. But, of course, in a different way, the majority of this very good idea that... No, we have not seen the very good idea, yes, but the very good idea that appeared are based on a change in the question, looking things in a different way, and uh, the most uh, 
the most uh, common aspect of all of them is that they change the idea of who is the people. And the people shift from being uh, who are the problems and who are there waiting to be served toward a profile of person that are capable to use some resources that they have, some network that they have. Five years ago, if I presented a slide like that, it took me half an hour to explain what are. I'm sure that uh, you know maybe not all the names that are there, but at least half of them. Because uh, in this period, uh, luckily, even if the very general environment is going uh, worse and worse, uh, this new way of doing things moved from what was, in my view, 10 years ago, very weak signals, very promising signals, so uh, signals that was uh, telling that something different could happen. Now they are much more than weak signals. They are still minorities, but they are strong minorities, especially in some field. For instance, if we consider everything that is around food, in uh, today, whatever, I am sure here, and, but it could be the same if you were in China, if you talk about the possibility of having another way of considering the relationship between agriculture and farming and food, everybody more or less know that there is a possibility to base everything on organic food, a different relationship with season, with distance, zero mile food, and so on and so forth. So it's not the majority. The majority is still highly industrialized food and agriculture, junk food, and so on. But there is a growing consciousness that there is another possibility. So this is one of the cases in which, in my view, we are really moving from signals to trends. I don't know if you are familiar. Signals means something that is qualitatively very important, but uh, quantitatively is uh, disappearing. A trend is something that is not only important qualitatively, but you can start to see that there are also some quantities, something you can recognize in the society also in quantitative terms. And as you can see, it, this new approach touches the, all the sphere of uh, daily life of people, from food that I mentioned, to taking care of the elderly, to mobility, to regenerating of the city, and so on and so forth. Uh, what is so important is that uh, they are not only ideas, they are prototype. We are mainly designers or architects, so we know what is a prototype. A prototype is not already the final product, but it's something, an artifact, that shows that things could be done. And this makes the difference when you try to design for social innovation, that you have not to invent necessarily from zero. But, and not all, only to steal some ideas, but you confront it with something that is more than an idea, because maybe they are a very peculiar group of people, very strange, but you can say somebody in the world has been capable to do like this, and you can study it, you can promote it, you can work on it. Remembering and this is my personal observation, that we are talking, for the majority of them, still about prototypes. And you know that the difference in between a prototype and the final product could be quite large. So when we talk about uh, the social innovation cases as we see them today, we have to be capable at the same time to understand all the new potentiality that are there, but also to understand that if we imagine the vision of a sustainable society, it's not simply a society in which this kind, exactly the same way of doing, will be reproduced to everybody. But this will be the idea on which other idea will come, and something else will happen, as everybody, every time that we have the innovation journey that you start with the very beginning idea, first prototype, and afterward they consolidate at a certain point, it could be very diverse. This is important because sometimes if you simply try to imagine a society that is all done by what you can see here on the screen, it's not said that everybody likes it. 
So you cannot impose to everybody. But there could be some idea, and in my view, there is a kind of framework that could generate the new visions. And this is what we are going to talk about today. I already told that they are so diverse, but they have one very important point. And a very important point is that the profile of the people that is involved is people that are active and collaborative. And active and collaborative clash against the stereotype of the client or the user or the consumer that uh, more or less everybody, including the designer, have thought when you think to for whom you design. So I think that you will share, we all have been taught to think to somebody, of course, we have to take care. There is one way of talking about design, saying we are the one that are representative of the user or consumer into the design team. And afterward, with the user-centered design, you say, oh my, you have to look very well with ethnographic research, put the lens, try to understand what people want, how they behave. But always, maybe with a good lens, good microscope, considering the user as people that like to be there to express their own need and somebody that solved the need from them. So in some way, the ideal vision of somebody that have a very good moment in their life is sitting on the chair with somebody that serve him or her. So this vision that the quality of life is when you are out from your work, so you are not active, and you are mainly served, and you are mainly alone to be served, is the way in which normally we have described the clients or the user. Now, it's not my invention. It's uh, something that can be seen. There are, in this moment, hundreds of thousands, millions of people that, by choice, decide not to be passive, but to be active, and in some way, that could be very diverse, depending on the specificity of the different culture, re-recognize re -reco again the power of collaborating, the fact that doing things together is powerful. And this is very important in my view, and will be very important when we will go back to the issue about the makers, because I think that you can, even if you're not talking about them yet, but there is something that is in the same spirit. So it's a little bit the spirit of the age, that in the mainstream of modernity, that as you know, modernity has been defined as a process of individualization, and the modern idea of production and consumption is a process of de-skilling people and uh, putting people in an angle, say, what you want, I bring it to you. You have to pay, but if you have the money, I can bring you what you need. Now we have this uh, different kind of attitude. So it's emerging a new profile of who are our, as designer, clients that are people willing to do things, to be active, and uh, to be collaborative. By the way, it's not so strange. We are uh, social animals, so we like to be in groups, and we like, everybody knows, we like also to be to do things, to show to ourselves and to the other that we are capable of doing. There is the value of making that is a part of the human way of being. So we are simply rediscovering something that has been in some way put into parentheses, brackets, for a period, but uh, it's part of the very basic. So it's not going back to the past. It's going deep to the humans, if I can say. Even if something that is appearing with this social innovation as some rules in uh, the pre-modern, pre-industrial society, in my view, is not a nostalgic coming back to that period. It's simply to try to go back to something that is very human at the end of the day, when you really try to understand who are the human beings. And uh, this issue is also worldwide. Even if with many differences, now I have no time to, to discuss, but we can maybe discuss afterwards. Um, it has been said that I'm coordinating a network on design for social innovation that is uh, really worldwide. And uh, we find that some basic that are very similar if you are in uh, Europe or if you are in China. 
Of course, it's different if you are in a village that is not yet modernized. And so this is another discussion that we can do. I think that the notion about collaborative people and collaborative organization can work also for the villages. But now let's say it's easier if we think not to the Western and the Eastern, but to the modernized layers into the society that are very transversal. So the modernized layers, you can find it, of course, more if you are in Sweden and less if you are in South Africa. But there are some people also in South Africa that is more or less in the same kind of attitude as you can have in Sweden. So this is something that is happening worldwide. And uh, OK, I already said you can have people that uh, go together to have a community. You revitalize the neighborhoods, uh, create community gardens, uh, manage the, also the physical side of this, uh, the place where they live. And uh, they are start to be a lot. I already said this. And they are in some way experimenting new solutions that, at least for them, they work. So just to make better understand what, how they work, and also to go near to what uh, the designer can do, let me make two examples. Uh, this example is very well known. I use it because it's uh, so simple, clear, and uh, also a little bit photogenic, so it's nice to be seen. And uh, it's the community garden, for instance, this one is in New York. So you know what is a community garden. It's a vacant property so that has been uh, squatted at the beginning and transformed in a garden. If you go there, you find as all these cases that are all very multiple. So even if you call them community garden, they are far more than a community garden. So they are a garden. People can like them because they are a garden. But they are also a social center where things happen, where people socialize, where create a larger environment that is better and safer in the city. So they are playing a very vast and articulate function for the city that are all there. If you see somebody working there, and you were a community garden at the end, it's a public garden, so it's a public place. So in the, normally, if you see a public place, somebody that is working, you assume that it's employed by the city council. Of course, in the case of community gardens, it's a citizen that is gardening. And so we have one of the major aspects of all these uh, new models, that is that the different role, blur, that goes together. So it's working or it's enjoying. It has happened in human being. You can work and enjoy. So the people that make the community gardens, the ones that are really involved, of course, they have to like gardening. If they don't like gardening, they don't do it. And if they like gardening, the difference is, is that they discover two things, that if you live in, in, uh, in New York and uh, you like gardening, most probably you can put a, a pot of flowers on your window if you are alone. If you have a group, maybe you can squat a place and make a beautiful garden. So you can get something that otherwise you couldn't. And the second is that in the moment in which you do what you like, the garden, you are doing something that is good also for the neighborhoods, the city, and maybe the planet. So you are reinforced in what you do, not only for the economical result, I wanted the garden, I have a garden, but also because you feel good, you feel part of a bigger story. So there is a narrative that is larger than simply to have a garden for me and for my family. Uh, I did something. Uh. If you enter there, you can find that near the door of the garden, there is this uh, post poster. This says something that is very intriguing for who deal with services, because you discover that uh, the community gardens are part of an organization that is managed also by the city council, that is called Green Thumb. 
And Green Thumb is a part of the city council dealing with gardens. So it's a service delivering gardening without gardeners. What it is? In our language, it's a platform that permits to people that like gardening to be gardeners. But the intervention is not in directly in the final output, the garden. The work is in creating the conditions that permit to the willing to be gardeners. And this kind of a second layer service, so a service that is not giving the final result, but is giving the possibility for others to do what they want to do, this is the core, in my view, of the transformation of the concept of service that is appearing. From uh, service is always interaction in between people to get a result, but the traditional idea of service is the server one and the deliverer of the service that goes together and have a result. Now you have a more complex situation. You have a community that interacts to generate this garden, and they are supported and they interact with somebody that gives the condition to do it. Of And also, what is interesting is that in, in terms of the, if we tell this story with the language of service design, service design normally says there is a, a front stage and a backstage, front office and back office. In this case, front office and back office blur, but it's very important to see that to make the front office that is on the top, happens, so all the beautiful things that I said, people gardening, making society, etc., etc., you need also in this case a back office. And you need a back office the more than you move from the beginning, when there are some heroes that are very enthusiastic and do everything, making extraordinary efforts towards something that, as in the case of the community garden in New York, lasts since 30 years now. So in 30 years, you don't have the original heroes anymore. You understand when I say heroes? So it means that all this story at the beginning is the inventor. What in the technological scientific will be the inventor, and afterward there are somebody that transforms the invention in something else. So the social, normally, they have some heroes. Somebody, for ideological reason, for whatever reason, are capable to do something because they are really very committed, and they are capable to make it happen. But afterward, if nothing supports, the hero becomes tired. It's biological. It's normal. It has to be foreseen. And so you have to have a kind of institutionalization of this invention. That in this case is a very good word. It's not to make it bureaucratic. It's to create some rules, some tools, that permit to this very good idea to remain even when the heroes are tired. So, after 30 years, they organized all these things to make it happen. And of course, by the point of view of designer, we could say, this has to be designed. For the record, in the case of Community Garden, there have not been uh, formal designers. The story, maybe somebody knows, when they started, they were squatting, they were out of the law. They have confrontation with the police. So, if we can say that the 500 the community gardens that we have now in New York are the result of a participatory design, as it is in my view. So it's a case of applied participatory design. It shows in a very crystal way that participatory design can be very conflictual. But it can happen in this way. The other example is totally diverse. This is uh, decided from the top. Somebody decided to use this uh, idea of the cycle of care. So the idea circulate. What is the idea of cycle of care? It's uh, the idea that uh, if there are, I take a very concrete example, many people that have diabetes, many people that have obesity, many people that have this kind of problem that are not uh, the old-fashioned problem with your health. It was, I break my head, leg or I have a heart attack. 
that oh, you survive, somebody has to work on you. These are problems that last for decades. So probably there are other people that are peers to you that are very expert. If I have diagnosed as a, uh, with diabetes uh, yesterday, somebody that is uh, living with diabetes since uh, two decades had a lot to tell me. So the cycle of care is to say you have not only to depend vertically from the nurses and the doctors, but you can create a club of so people that share the same problem. And uh, these clubs can give, uh, deliver a fantastic service, very attentive, very clever, very also empathic. So this is the idea, but the idea is to be sustained. And this is the case that uh, I like it a lot. It's not the only one, but I like it a lot that has been promoted by Participle, that is a company led by Hillary Cotton in, uh, in England, in which they create... Now, I had to accelerate a little bit, but I think that you have got, I hope, the core issue. So this has been designed. There are the members. There's a kind of economy of the exchange, one exchange with the other, some help. There are some uh, volunteers. We are in the economy of the gift. Somebody do something for somebody else. And, and we have uh, an agent, a social worker, that is paid. So this is very interesting economical model in which you have an economy that is a kind of ecology of economies because you have together market, exchange, gift, and uh, these things work if you imagine, let's say, a an an, uh, business model that can keep together these different motivations that we can call different economies. Also in this case, to have what is on the top, you need something that supports it. And, uh, well, I think that you understand very well that there are different kinds of activities, from some very material as given some rules, towards something very practical as giving some spaces. And all together, we can call it enabling system. That means the system that permits to have something in a certain way. By the way, this is very important for me to be told, because the story of people that organize themselves can have a an interpretation that, in my view, is very dangerous, that is the ultra-right interpretation of that, as in UK is the idea of the big society of David Cameron. They simply say, OK, the civil society, they are so good, let them organize themselves. But to have things that works, you need some kind of support, because otherwise they do not work. The only thing that makes a little bit complicated discussion is that it's true that to solve some problem, we have to reskill people in the capability of being active and being collaborative and being part of the solution. But to get this result, we need an intervention. The only issue is not the traditional intervention or the traditional welfare state. It's another kind of uh, somebody, Michel Bowens, called it a partner state. A state that is not a kind of big brother that helps you from a cradle to grave, but a kind of a big partner that is capable to dialogue with you, you or the group, your community, and to help you in what has to be done. So this is the definition. And I, I want to say that another difference in the two examples that I bought are different by the point of view of the design. One has been uh, co-designed in a wild way. The second one has been more formally co-designed, but they are also different for another issue. The second one have a different product and services that are part of this enabling system, but could not work without a digital platform. So one big change that happens in the last 10 years is what I before called the big uh, com first convergence. When we started to talk about uh, this new wave of social innovation, the technology was very, very low. Nowadays, there is no one of those new initiatives that happens that do not use, in a wise way, the new technologies of the network. And uh, I know, I'm sure that you know better than me, that if you browse, you find a lot 
an incredible number now of platforms that propose what? Propose the possibility to take people that are spread, scattered, individualized, and bring them together to in the physical world. So, in some way, they are doing the vice versa of the stereotype of what the te this technology do. The stereotype is you had a community, the traditional one, arrives the new media, and they break the community because people, instead of discussing with the neighbor, discuss with somebody living in the other side of the world. This is the stereotype, and it happens. So, the network creates a kind of a breaking of the traditional communities, but when they are designed in a certain way, they can also reorganize scattered people, individualized people, and create the possibility to do things together. And uh, all these cases are, in some way, a kind of a extended uh, mob. So, people that do not know each other, that are invited around some issue to do something together with a platform that offers the opportunity how to do it. So, this is, in my view, very interesting, and it's uh, what I better know, the first convergence in between uh, this line of social innovation and the line of uh, internet and social media that at the beginning was totally different arenas. The two groups of people do not talk to each other, and now they merge, and they are already merged a lot. Well, I accelerate, there are some uh, discussion. This kind of merging has created a different environment, also different recognition, and the result is that uh, the issue about social innovation moved from the fringe to the center. So everybody, even too much, talk about social innovation today, and they talk about social innovation. This is social innovation in Europe. That is uh, the first time that has been formally recognized by Europe that exists social innovation. Europe are always talking about uh, innovation, but was only the technological one. Now, at least for me, it's very simple, not only because they organize this social innovation in Europe, but if you look to the call for research, for, for my group, it was always very difficult to find a call that was talking about social innovation. Now there are plenty of calls that are talking about social innovation. So, these are words. We have to see the reality, but something changed, and the whole idea became something that is really starting to rethink the new government, new business models, new product service, and uh, as I said, at the end of the day, this is a very deep rediscussion about the notion of service. And the rediscussing the notion of service is a discussion of welfare. And discussing the welfare is a discussion of the state. And the relationship in between citizens and the state. To conclude this part, after five minutes more, uh, yeah. Uh, I started saying we can have one big social technical innovation, but this is not homogeneous. There are moments in which one moves more fa faster than the other. So we have had waves of technological innovation, waves of uh, social innovation, and when you have a merge in between the two, you can have something that really makes the difference. And in this case, it made it visibly make the difference because a notion that was really very marginal until a few years ago now has to be seen what will be the final result. But it's uh, on the center. It is on the center. Why? Especially in Europe, but not only Europe. Eh? Also in China, they are talking a lot about social innovation uh, because uh, everybody recognized that there are some problems related to work, uh, to services, to welfare, to social services that has to be solved. So all those people recognize in the social innovation the possibility to rediscuss what are the services. And in my view, there is a lot to be designed here. Now, my hypothesis was, I think that it's not yet there, but we could have a similar convergence that in this case will not be so much on uh, the service side, but more on the production side. And, uh, of course, the starting point 
in my view, is so interesting, but it's still far, far away. I like, when I started to, to think to this story, I had this, uh, I don't know, maybe two or three years ago, and I like it a lot, but making stuff, why to make stuff? We should have from making stuff to make the world better and to challenge the possibility of doing it. And uh, so all the situations that we know that are so interesting has in some way to be seen less by the technological point of view, or has to be seen by the technological point of view, but has to be seen by the point of view of the change in the organizations that are needed to move from simply make stuff, because making stuff is interesting, towards something that is really the beginning of a new story. And this is uh, so interesting because it could bring uh, production and economy in places that are now uh, with uh, very low potentialities. So it's interesting also politically at the international scale. It's uh, the necessity to see, okay, there is this group of people that are enthusiastic and they are focalizing on a relatively small group of activity, but to see that at the end of the day, they could change the mentality and create a new atmosphere for many others. For instance, in Italy, uh, the strength of Italy are the medium and small side companies that are in crisis today. So the old challenge, and this is also what my colleagues in, in days is working on this topic are doing, is to try to see in which way the power, the energy, the enthusiasm that comes from the movement, uh, to simplify the say of the makers, can influence the way in which these medium and small side companies organize themselves. There is, of course, a possibility to rethink craftsmanship and to rethink both the new craftsmanship, that is the one that comes through the technology, but also to rethink the old one in a view that is more large and distributed. And uh, there is the issue that uh, production is also production not only of material goods. At the end of the day, the most mature idea of local production, even if now I'm talking about the makers, is much more in food, because the idea of the zero-mile food, the idea of eating something that is produced nearby, eating something that is seasonal, is really very strong and mature in the food. So we have to be capable to see the energy that comes from some very specific activity, but to put it in something that could be larger, and for instance, connecting it with what is happening on the relationship in between the cities and the countryside. That is a very interesting trend of transformation. There are, well, I have no time, and probably you know it, but there are some stories that uh, 20 years ago could be ridiculous as uh, to talk about the importance of the farming in the city could appear something that in Italy we did during the fascism when uh, they, we think that we had to be autosufficient. Nowadays, it's seriously discussed as a way to create more resilient cities, as a way to create cities that are capable to last in time through the difficulties that can happen. And all this story enter in one of the biggest ways to talk about sustainability today, that is resilience. So the possibility to create systems that are capable to be stressed and to have problems without collapse. So we have to see that uh, the new ecologies of production that can happen have the value now because there are some bodies that are pushing on something very specific, but the result, it's an ecological view, and an ecological view means put together different possibility and to create ecosystems in which uh, high-tech, low-tech, craftsmen, farmers can work and have their own specificity and work together. So the hope is that if we could have the merging in between this very interesting line that comes from the makers with what is happening in these decades on social innovation, we can have, as I said, a new system of production, and that if we took all together, we have a an emerging new world that could be this scenario that I don't need now to explain it because I think that it's clear that there are some elements that are related to the fact to be small scale 
but connected, and uh, to the potentiality that we are today having uh, a way to scale up without growing in dimension, but multiplying and connecting. So this has been also very well said in the first uh, speech introduction, and this is also the conclusion, I hope more or less in time. Thank you. This is a strange theater, because uh, there are sufficient people, but given that the screen is so big, everybody is there. So here in the front, there are very few volunteers that are compliment. Thank you to be here. <laughs> no, because looking at my level, I feel alone. Afterward, I look afterwards. No, but there are somebody. OK, please. Yeah. You can also speak in Spanish. In general, I should understand. Thank you. Um, I was interested in your description of, uh, let's say, current governments as uh, partners. Uh, and you also were pointing at this problem of, of course, in a in, um, world in crisis. Uh, the partnership can also be uh, a way to disguise that actually budget cuts are being made. Mm -hmm. Did you find any, let's say, ways of, of uh, questioning uh, these kinds of proposal, proposals of partnerships for where they are, in fact, uh, ways of uh, saving money or innovative ways of being a real partner to a citizen? Mm -hmm. like, do, you, do you have any markers of why, where you could see the difference between the, these two types of uh, partnership and partnership? So the, two times, the, the two kinds is the one in which these kind of things are interesting only because they permit it to the government to spend less or when there are also good intentions to create a more lively society. Uh, well, uh, I, can say I, I don't have a very clear answer, but I say that this is uh, one of the topics. If, if I can advertise, ah, it's not anymore there. If I can advertise what we do, this network, it's a network uh, that is for some reason based on the School of Design and uh, laboratory that works in the School of Design. But it's organized in uh, thematic clusters. And one of the thematic cluster is on this topic that I discussed today, so more on the distributed and open production, but one, the first one that we had was called public and collaborative. So what exactly in that direction? Uh, knowing that uh, the, re the main reason why these topics enter the, at the high level in the agenda of the politician is because they are seen as a way to cut the expenses. So we have to be conscious about that. Nevertheless, and uh, I would say much better than me. Where, where do you come from? Belgium. Eh? From Belgium. For Belgium. In any case, the, the place where there are the most interesting things happening, happening are in UK. So if you read uh, to give to everybody that's interested, you, you Google and you search for Young Foundation, for Nesta, and for New, uh, new Economic Foundation you find a lot of very intensive discussion about that and the problem, et cetera, et cetera. In my view, I feel that uh, in any case, it's most more important that the level of the debate moved from, uh, yes, the traditional welfare state or not, toward a different way in which we can imagine to activate people. As everything that is, in my view at least, really very important, you, there is a kind of new platform of this discussion in which you have uh, the right and the left, or a different kind of sensitivity. So, in my view, it's good that now we have a conversation in between the one, the CEO of the story, only to cut the, the expenses, and who say that there could be something else. It's in any case better than discussing as we have done for 20 years. So, in my view, this is a positive signal. The fact that it could be uh, as we, I think, also you think they should be, is also because in, in the way in which we say it works. In the other way, it do not work, because to work, and this is the small contribution that I try to give, is that you need a platform. So this platform can be generated in many different ways, but it's not a kind of simply say, okay, as I said before, the, the, uh, 
a big society view. The society is so lively, there are so many things that they are capable to do. Let's do it. In the meantime, I cut all the expenses for the social. No, there has to be a reinterpretation of what is the social. Second point, it's not so easy, but there are some, uh, and it's clear why it's not so easy, and there are also some ideas that are around. Why it is not so easy, especially when you have to deal on some subject with the institutions? The, the institutions are, uh, by definition, very rigid. So if you have, a, for instance, we work last year in uh, New York, on uh, the institution in New York, they deal with social housing. And we propose that to solve some problem of the management of the social housing, they could involve the citizens. This is coherent, no? So instead of people waiting for somebody, they make everything, they can organize. There are also people that are unemployed, so you can imagine to organize. Very clear, they say, yes, fantastic, good idea, but we cannot do it. Because it's not in what an institution can do in their own definition. And uh, I've seen that not only we, small people, but everywhere in the world who arrived to talk and discuss and try to make an experiment on that had the same kind of problem and a solution is emerging. The solution is emerging as different names, but the notion is to create a very special space that is a space, one of the claim is where is allowed to fail. So in which if you think that you have to experiment something, you have to imagine that the result can also be a failure. But you create a condition in which you can learn from failure. So to go on in the learning process, you have to act and to learn from what you do. So if the institution is blocked and you cannot act, you cannot learn. So the, these uh, spaces, they could can be called uh, social innovation places, social innovation spaces, sometimes leave, some living labs are like this, are places in which Mind, Mind Lab from in, uh, Denmark, they have in common that are recognized by the institution, but are uh, detached from the institution, even if they are recognized by the institution, and the place where is the possibility to experiment. So in some, I don't know, maybe I have an answer to your question. So it's, it's not so obvious what to do. It's obvious there is a problem with the institution, also when they are willing to do something. And uh, I think the, the overall idea, but this really embraces also the other problem, is the capability for all of us, including the institution, to recognize that if we are in a transition, and the good thing of the tragedy of today is that it's very clear to everybody that we are in some way in a transition. We have to see ourselves as a big experiment place. And so what is the meaning of this experimentation? How we can manage and promote and in some way also orient this huge experimentation that we have to do? This is uh, the topic that should be commonly recognized. And afterward, if you want to experiment, you have to create places in which experiment is possible. And uh, for me, experiment is possible means that you have to assume that you can fail. And secondly, that you have to have a structure that permits to learn from failure. So in an experiment place, failure are not totally a failure because they teach you a lot on what to do and you can imagine to go on. Morning, Ezio. Thanks for your talk, Alistair. Um, ah. Where we, we, have, we have, a, I think, a, a lot of fantastic examples. I'm over here. Ah. We have a lot of fantastic examples, and I think many more will be talked about at this conference. But how do we communicate this idea of mutuality, the mutual benefits? Because I think we've not been so successful with sustainable design, 
We haven't been so successful with eco-design and many other adjectives before design, these different ways of designing. So open design is a different way of designing. We haven't been spectacularly successful in communicating the mutual benefits. Because one of the clear things from the, the, the projects you showed and, and the way you talked is there are many collaborators. So because there are many collaborators, they're perceiving a benefit of collaboration. So what can we do in, in your estimation to, to better demonstrate, I think you use the, word, the language sometimes, amplify. Um, how, how do we talk about the, the mutual benefits of these collaborations because I think that also shares risk and it, it deals with this idea of experimentation that you mm -hmm. rightly said we must find a better culture of experimentation mm -hmm. so how do we my simple question is how do we talk better and illustrate the mutual benefits of say open design compared to design mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, thanks that's a very very good question to to be provocative, I say, we would have to have better designers. <laughs> because, uh, in my view, uh, the old story about social innovation, not only the one more technical makers, also the more the one on services, also when there have been designers, have been uh, dominated by one of the sides of the design, that is problem solving how we solve the problem. Even myself, until now, I talk mainly about uh, there are big problems, people are capable to solve them. And when you try to solve them, of course, you put the accent on the economical side of the story, economically in a very general sense. So I, I have a problem, I get some result. But uh, the story of civilization is not only made of problem solving, a civilization is also made of uh, sense making. Big uh, system of meaning in which we are. And uh, the designer should be capable to work on the problem solving side with others, but we should have a very special role in uh, creating and uh, amplifying the meanings. So for instance, I have not spoken about that today, but very modestly, one of the, my, my more frequent lectures now in this period is about emerging qualities. So in the same way that I tried to analyze the case today as I did, you can try to look at them and say, yes, but there is something interesting by the point of view of meaning that is appearing. And in my view, yes. So this could be the way. For instance, to remain on something that is important is one of the reasons why I like so much the story about the makers, is that uh, sustainability asks for, well, you were talking about something else, sorry, but this comes easier for me, a different relationship with work. And uh, everything that restarts to say that people like to do what they do, they do it because they like it, it's a kind of craftsmanship. No? In the definition of Richard Sennett, craftsman is somebody that works for the sake of the quality of what he's doing before anything else. So the quality of the craftsmanship in this very deep sense is one of the things that should be promoted more, should be more clear that uh, in some way, again, is not to go back to the medieval, is to go down on the fact that we as human beings, we like also to make, not only to consume. So the way in which we can amplify this meaning is something that can be done, of course, by many different actors. But in between the many different actors, the designers are more than others. And uh, in my view, the fact that this uh, cultural side of social innovation, or we can say the cultural innovation linked to the social innovation, is the weakest point. And uh, in my view, we are near to what was uh, the Industrial Revolution before the Bauhaus. The Industrial Revolution before the Bauhaus had an engineer that was capable to do more or less everything. But there was no vision of the new quality that could emerge. And there had been somebody that, I don't know, I want to provoke you, but in my view, by the problem-solving point of view, the Bauhaus do not solve any new problems. 
But they had been revolutionary and they gave a name and a vision of what uh, the industry could be. It was not already in the industry, they added something that was uh, the notion of uh, democratization of consumption and a certain formal language. And uh, thanks to this action on the cultural side, they changed the story of the industry. Now, I don't want to misunderstood. I take this example just to say that in a certain moment, you have many things that happen, and something on the cultural side has to put them together and to give more visibility. And I think that this is the answer to your question. Afterward, the difficulties is that I am not more than convinced, but maybe this is ideological, that we cannot have another ba Bauhaus. You cannot have another Le Corbusier that make a beautiful drawing of the Ville Radieuse, and that drawing is the drawing that has influenced for the good and for the bad so many people. Now we are in ecosystems. There are no one place, there are no one style, there are no one thing that is the one you want to have. But the quality and maybe the beauty of the ecosystems, ecosystems, artificial and um, biological ecosystem, uh, how we give a name, how we uh, present them, how we make it visible, well, I think that this is a, a huge social issue, but it's largely something in which uh, design and architect should play our more specific role. Otherwise, we are too flattened on the managerial and technical language. I'm sorry to have to cut short the conversation. Um, we have timetabled um, other moments within the conference where we can have open discussions and debates, so hopefully this will carry on. But for now, thank you so much thank for you. a wonderful opening talk. <laughs>